Thanks for joining us today. We're here now with Matthew Guzdal, an assistant professor at the University of Alberta and a fellow at the Alberta Machine Intelligence Institute. Matthew is an expert in AI and machine learning as it's used for computational creativity. Thanks for joining us today, Matthew. Happy to be here. Could you please maybe start by telling us a little bit about your research interests? Yeah, of course. Um, so as you mentioned, I'm interested in sort of machine learning, AI, and computational creativity. So computational creativity is basically um, all those fun, creative, imaginative things that humans can do. Well, what if we can take that and sort of represent it computationally so we can have AI and machine learning systems that can do these things? And then how can that be used to both benefit sort of classic machine learning problems, but also turn that back around and then help the sort of uh, creative folks to do their work more easily, better, more efficiently, et cetera. Can you maybe tell us about, you know, one particular research avenue that you're, you're really excited about these days? Yeah, for sure. So right now I'm really interested in sort of uh, low training data machine learning problems, um, specifically when we're working with humans. So uh, if you might've heard previously, uh, it's often the case when we're talking about machine learning, we're talking about thousands or hundreds of thousands of instances of training data. And if we want a model to help a particular person on a particular task, say a design task where you want a particular person's style to come across, uh, then you're not going to have thousands of instances of training data. You might not even have hundreds, right? You might be down to only a, a small handful. So what do we do? in those cases, right? That's an open research problem that I'm currently working on. Um, one sort of particular instantiation of that problem is uh, what we've been calling the more AI maker, uh, which is a, a terrible pun on Mario Maker, which was a level design tool made by Nintendo as like a, a fun game that they released. Uh, so we made a version of it, but with more AI in it. Here's an example of the tool. This is me currently drawing um, some Super Mario Brothers blocks. I hit the end turn button. All these bricks up here along the top are being placed by the AI agent. Uh, it turns out that if you're talking about Super Mario Brothers level design, adding bricks at the beginning is a sort of nice, easy thing to do. Um, by keeping those bricks, I'm giving implicit feedback to the agent. I'm saying, yeah, that's a good thing. Uh, nicely done there. From here, what I'm doing is I'm giving like a little mini example. I'm, I'm sort of trying to show, here's a little mini a uh, piece of level design I want you, the AI agent, to learn. So a couple things happened there. It added this brick floating in space. That's useless. I get rid of that. That gives it a little bit of negative reward. And it added some more bricks up along the top, which it knows I like. And I kept those, so it's giving it more positive reward. It's saying, yes, give me bricks along the top. But I still wanted to learn this tiny sort of island pattern um, that doesn't really exist in the original Super Mario Brothers, so it's never seen it before. So uh, I also added some plants there. That's just for me. Partner thinking again, and it added a brick along the bottom. Useless. We're going to give it a third partial example here of the island pattern. Hit the enter button. And some interesting things happen here. So more bricks along the top. But there's a whole bunch of stuff here that's almost right, right? Uh, again, it's never seen this pattern ever before. So with two and a half examples, it gets so close. It's, it's literally like one tile off from where it was supposed to be. So I'm gonna go ahead and complete this third example. Uh, this takes a little second. And once I complete this third example, partner thinking some more, some more bricks, and it's sort of backed off, it's being more tentative. I'm gonna go ahead and remove those two ground blocks, give it a partial example here on the fourth one, and here's what happens. So more bricks along the top, but I'm going to pause it there. So you can see it got all of these local patterns totally right, right? The plants above the pipe with the ground underneath, having never seen this pattern ever before with just three and a little bit examples. It's not perfect, but this is the kind of thing that we ended up seeing with working with real actual published level designers, that people would get something that was close enough to what they wanted, that was sort of an interesting twist on what they were going for, and that ended up prompting them to sort of move on, use that, incorporate into their design and sort of get new and interesting things because of it. Well, that's fascinating. Um, I can already see some of the, the kind of application spaces, but maybe you could talk a little bit more about, you know, some of the ways that this might improve the, the lives of game developers and game designers. Right. So uh, we're particularly interested in how this project or an adaptation of this project could be used to uh, make a designer's life more easy, um, in particular in cases where we're looking at large amounts of design work. So if you're needing to produce a lot of stuff and not everything has to be perfect, but you do want it to match sort of your style, 
right? Can we speed up this process from a human user having to manually author each thing or having to manually approve each thing? Uh, any ways that we can sort of let designers use their time more effectively uh, and more efficiently, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a win, I think. So it's a bit of a, a shortcut, but with creativity still sort of baked in, so you're not sacrificing that creativity quite as much. Right. That's the hope that it's a shortcut, but a shortcut where we're not sacrificing your particular individual sort of style, your particular design sensibilities. Well, that's really interesting research, really fascinating stuff. Thanks so much for sharing it with us today, Matthew. You're welcome.